one of the criteria was, if you'll remember, that Matthew's gospel was written to the Jews. So if it's schmoozing too much with the Jewish community, you'd give it a gray or a black. Luke was written for the Gentile community, as we talked about last week. Well, if, if it's talking about uh, slamming the Jews, for example, they'd probably give it a gray or black because that would have been too schmoozing with the uh, Gentile community. If it was something outlandish that made Jesus or, the, or his community look bad, then they'd probably give it a pink or a red because if Jesus wouldn't have benefited from it, if it would have been not something that would put Jesus or the, or the religious community in a good light, while they must have been words of Jesus, otherwise they would have never created it themselves, then they put a red or a pink. My problem with the Jesus seminar and why I don't like it isn't just because it's really schmaltzy putting a little bead of a different color in a <laughs> pot. I mean, these guys are religious uh, theologians of high regard. They could have come up with something more in interesting and substantial than a bead in a cup. But what I really think is, uh, I struggle with is just because you say things that are sometimes uh, challenging or argumentative doesn't mean that it's actually Jesus words and sometimes Jesus might have said things that were acceptable to the community he was preaching to so why would you automatically make that the criteria that gives it a gray or a black so I really struggled with the Jesus seminar uh, but I had a, uh, one of my professors in college was uh, was part of that um, Arlen Jacobson who I have a great deal of respect for so I don't want to belittle the Jesus seminar but I struggle with it but the reason that I bring it up today is that both the Luke passage and the Thomas passage are in pink, which means it probably, both of them, their words sound like they would have been the words of Jesus, which is pretty strong. Matthew was given a gray rating because his seemed to be schmoozing too much to the Jewish community, for example. And you may be asking, why isn't John mentioned, the Gospel of John? Because John A. didn't deal with that particular passage, but even more so, the Jesus Seminar gave John about just about the whole gospel a black. Because they didn't think that any of those were the words of Jesus, because they were more like sermons that tried to express or convey meaning about who Jesus was, but not quoting his words. Now, how do I explain that? Remember that their, their understanding of history is different than ours. For example, they didn't have an understanding of plagiarism. So in other works of written during about the same period, if you wanted your work to be read, you didn't write your name down. You wrote somebody famous down and then people would read it. So if I wrote a devotional on a particular day, I wrote, I'd write Pope Francis. And then you'd read it. <laughs> now today, that would be called plagiarism. 2,000 years ago, they wouldn't have thought about it that way. They were trying to convey information, and any way that they could get you to read it was acceptable. So the same thing applied in the gospel writings. They would give credence to Jesus' words or to an apostle. Now, oftentimes, they were not the actual words, but they gave them that so that you would read it because... They weren't trying to impart a history lesson. They were trying to impart the gospel. And if they got you to understand the faith, if they got you to accept the faith, they didn't care how you got it. So they would quote people and say it was from somebody that it wasn't. And that's hard for our 21st century minds to get around because we're so caught up in plagiarism. And we're so careful to share and cite where, our, uh, where we got our information from. That wasn't important to them. They wanted you to change your mind, to repent or reverse your thinking, and they wanted you to accept God through Jesus Christ and the triune God. Especially the later into this process, by the time of the Gospel of John, at the end of the first century, that's what it was about. So... Try to understand that we're not doing a history lesson, but we now are trying to find out the words of Jesus and what the real meaning was. So that's why we have all this frustration 
and trying to figure out the real words. Now it's interesting that we're poo-pooing, or at least the Jesus Seminar is poo-pooing, the Gospel of Matthew, which is in our Bible, and we're really celebrating one that's not even in our Bible, in the Gospel of Thomas. So what I'd like to do is to take a moment and have us read them. And I'll bring it around, so I've got to ask people who are relatively close. Um, I don't know how I'm going to do this, because what I'd like to do is have... Uh, Pam, if you wouldn't mind, do you have the copies? Mm -hmm. Would you read the first page and go from Luke to Matthew and back to Luke? When you go and look at the big page, when you're looking at the Gospel parallels, what they're trying to do is they're helping you understand this. At the beginning, it's indented down, but it's written closer to the top in Luke. That means that Luke is writing about something that Matthew doesn't include. And then they, and they start reading about Matthew when he starts to be at the same place. When there's overlap, they're saying similar things. And then when you move up to the next side, at the top of the page over here, Luke is mentioning things that aren't in Matthew, but then Matthew mentions some things that aren't in Luke, and then Luke finishes with stuff that isn't in Matthew. So it's kind of complicated. So I guess rather than have you read one and bounce back and forth, um, Pam, if you wouldn't mind reading Matthew to us, and I'll try to bring this over far enough that you can be heard. Show me which one you want me to read. Matthew, the one on the left. Okay. Matthew 22, 1 to 10. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And now, Laura, if you would read Luke, and that's the one on the right. Over here. Both here and here. Okay. And listen for what she's not reading as much as what she is. One of the dinner guests, on hearing this, said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent the slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I brought a piece of land. I bought a piece of land. I must not go and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I have to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have just been married, and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Keep going. Down to here. Okay. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And then the slave said, sir, what have you ordered has been done and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. Okay, so as you're looking back and forth, what are some differences between Matthew and Luke? Can you give me some examples? There's no mention of a wedding banquet. In which one? In Luke. That's a great example. What's that? Yeah, just says it's a great dinner, so there's a difference. And, why, and you also ask yourself, why would, one, why would one go out of his way not to mention the wedding banquet? You know, is it, is it because the wedding banquets are important in the Jewish community and not in the, in the uh, Gentile community? Who mentioned the wedding banquet? Matthew. Matthew. And wedding banquets were important in Judaism, but they probably were not important as important in the Greek community. So that would be one reason why it would just be a great banquet and not a wedding banquet. What are some of the other ones? Is there anything else that could, jumps to mind? Laura? In, in Matthew, they, when they say they're not coming, in Matthew, when they say they're not coming to the wedding, he goes out and finds them and is enraged and kills them. Or in the other one, they just say they're not coming. Yeah, there's a, bit, a little bit of a difference there, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> And so, again, you ask yourself, why would, they, why would one say it one way? 
Uh, perhaps it was just emphasis. Perhaps there were historical things going around that. That's something to ferret out on your own time. But those are questions we always ask. So rather than take the time to explain what scholars are saying in the half hour that I have left, I want to just raise the questions and, ha and help you learn how to ask those questions and then go find them on your own through commentaries and Bible dictionaries and some of the uh, techniques that I showed you in other books last week. Now I'll read the Gospel of Thomas that's not in the Bible and listen for one of the uh, real differences. Jesus said, and this is, you have this in your paperwork. Jesus said, a person was receiving guests. When he had prepared the dinner, he sent his servant to invite the guests. The servant went to the first and said to that one, my master invites you. And that one said, some merchants owe me money. They are coming to me tonight and I must go and give instructions to them. Please excuse me from the dinner. The servant went to the another and said to that one, my master has invited you. That one said to the servant, I have bought a house and I have been called away for a, for a day. Shall, um, I shall have no time. The servant went to another and said to that one, my master invites you. And that one said to the servant, my friend is to be married and I am to arrange the dinner. I shall not be able to come. Please excuse me from dinner. And the servant went to another and said to that one, my master invites you. That one said to the servant, I have bought an estate and I am now going to collect the rent. I shall not be able to come. Please excuse me. And the servant returned and said to the master, those whom you invited to dinner have asked to be excused. The master said to the servant, go out into the streets and bring back whomever you find to have dinner. Buyers and merchants will not enter the places of my father. So what is the difference between Thomas and the others? In Matthew, it's the merchants that are bad. And so you, you would ask yourself, okay, what's going on at that time that the merchants are the evil ones? And that's different from the other two. Is there anything else you can come up with that's unique or different about uh, Thomas? One of the things that I noticed just in my reading is that um, notice where marriage comes up. My friend is to be married, and apparently that's not an excuse. So you've taken a wedding banquet, and now you've turned the wedding into something that's no longer an excuse. So again, you ask yourself, why in the world wouldn't they write the same thing, especially if they have a common thread of where they're reading from? So that's where we're starting. But let, I want to spend most of my time on Luke's exegetical emphasis, so that, but I will bring in the others as we have a chance. The Great Supper occurs in the larger travel narrative. So this is where, there's a whole bunch of stories and parables while Jesus is traveling from the, uh, from the Galilee down to Jerusalem. So that's literary criticism because we're talking about a larger narrative. Only Luke records Jesus' fair at meals with Pharisees. That was another thing. Uh, in these larger uh, literary criticism, and this seems to be the setting for an anti-Pharisaic speeches. And of course that would be in Luke because Luke is preaching to Gentiles who love to hear about how awful the Pharisees are. That would be an example of historical criticism. And this is part of the larger section that begins with an invitation to an important Pharisee. So you'll have a number of these where Jesus is going to meet with an important Pharisee in Luke and different stories come out of that. And that is an example of words and motifs. The going to see the important Pharisee is a motif that shows up in Luke, but not in Matthew or in Mark. Now there's a banquet atmosphere in the Gospel of Luke. And it has regular features like guests and food, places, invitations, acceptance and refusal. In that society, whether or not you were a person of faith or you were a Roman leader or in the Roman military, you followed the same pattern. You go out, you invite the guests, you prepare the food, you set up the places, you set up the invitations, you send out someone to go and invite them because they didn't have email. They didn't have a phone. 
So you took somebody in the military, they took a private, <laughs> and in, in the house you took one of the servants or the slave, and they would walk around to all the neighbors and f invite the people they wanted to attend. That's how they got the invitations out. And parchment was so expensive that they would never write cards or letters because it was too expensive to do. It was much cheaper to send your slave or your servant around to make the invitation. Now Luke's meal or feast and parables may be redactionally placed within the context of the Greek symposium literature. Now that's a whole lot of big words, but let's talk about Greek symposium literature. Because we're talking about Luke, we're talking about Greeks, not Jews. And in the symposium was a gathering of cultivated people who held an evening meal and then after the meal would discuss or argue philosophy. That's what happened in places like Athens and in the Greek world. And so Paul, the Apostle Paul and uh, Luke, in both Luke and it's ex explained even more in the book of Acts, would have these gatherings where they would have meals and then they would discuss. And it's at one of those out in the public square where Paul takes on one of the, th one of the philosophers in the public view and they have their discussion. And they may be argumentative, but they're very respectful. It's a process. It's a part of the symposium. You learned at the feet of other philosophers. And so to make sure you were, you were kneeling and listening at the feet of the right theologian, the, the or theologian, excuse me, the philosopher, you would, the philosopher would go out into the square and argue his, or probably his, but let's say his or her part, uh, point. And if you argued well, you got more students. Students would go to the square, and they would listen for the arguments and the philosopher who they thought that was the most intelligent and could teach them the most. And then they would follow that person, and that's how they got received their education. So when the Apostle Paul walked out and in that moment started um, making his argument and arguing for the theologians or philosophers, he was hoping some of those philosophy students would come and follow this new theologian, Paul, and become part of the faith. And so that's part of what happens in a symposium and in symposium literature, in symposium culture. This could be interpreted as a means of de-intellectualizing de of the faith because now the meal and the discussion didn't require an, an esteemed philosopher to be there. People could do that in their own house churches. So it was a de-intellectualization of the faith. You didn't need some amazing teacher to come in. The people could gather around their parchments. They could study their word. They could share their prayers. And it became so freeing for the Greeks because the poor Greeks who wouldn't have the time or the money to send their children or themselves to sit at the foot of a philosopher because they had to make a living they could learn on, their, on, their, on the Sabbath day, on that one day a week, that Sunday. And they could learn to read, they could learn to write, they could learn about the faith, and their words were listened to by someone else. That was a powerful thing that every church became its own little symposium. And it freed a lot of the poor because they felt that they had a voice that could be heard and they would learn and they would grow and they'd be listened to. So Greek converts would naturally attempt to evolve their philosophy into Christianity. They would come to the faith through uh, Greek philosophy, but also through the symposium. And so that's why Paul was out arguing with the philosophers, because if the faith were, were true and held together, it could stand up to Greek philosophy. Gnosticism was an outgrowth, outgrowth of this intellectual process. And I don't want to get in too much into Gnosticism today, but Gnosticism was a form of, uh, that came out of the Greeks, and Gnosis means knowledge. And they came to believe that they had a knowledge of God, and they incorporated Christianity, they incorporated uh, Greek philosophy, and took it to a very strange place. The, and without going on too big a tangent, the Jews believed in a bodily resurrection. 
That's the body was important. That's why it was important that Jesus didn't just res go up to heaven by soul, but his body was also resurrected. The Jews to this, uh, many Jews to this day believe that if they are buried on the Mount of Olives, right outside the old city of Jerusalem, they will be the first to be resurrected into heaven when God, when God's, uh, reach, when God comes down, the Messiah comes and they're resurrected, the bodies will literally come out of the ground and up into heaven. So they had an important part in the body. Gnosticism believed, as an outgrowth of Greek philosophy, that the body was corrupt. The body is what made us sinful. If, the, if this was our, our unholy shell, and when we are freed from this earthly body, then we, our soul, which is totally separate from the body, will then be freed from its sin and its ignorance, and it will be truly enlightened when the soul is separated from this horrible earthly jail called our body, our shell. And so that's the Gnostics believe that, and that became a big war between Gnosticism and Jewish Christians. And I, I could get into that at a later time, but I'm watching the clock today, but it, it needed to be at least be mentioned. This parable allows even the illiterate to have a rightful place within the family of God. That's what's huge. They can listen, they can learn, and they can share and be listened to. Now the characters within the passage, this is part of literary criticism again. You have to find out who the cast of characters are. There's the master of the house, the guests, the principal guest or the Pharisee if it's in Luke, and those who are not invited. And that's the, the, and then in Luke's emphasis, Luke here, like elsewhere, shows his own commitment to the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Matthew doesn't seem nearly as concerned. Now, I've had people from time to time say, Scott, you're not preaching from the Bible. All you're talking about is politics. Because you're talking all the time about the poor and all of that. Why don't you just get back to the Bible? Well, most of the time when I'm preaching on those things, it's from the Gospel of Luke. So I'll have a whole year in the, um, in the uh, common lectionary, which I preach from, and most ministers do. If you do the Bible in order, if you do it all three years without missing a Sunday on the lectionary, you will hear almost all of the Bible. They skip, but by and large, and certainly within the Gospels, you will hear all of them. But one year you'll get Matthew, one year you'll get Luke, one year you'll get um, Mark, and then you'll get John mixed in. So, when it's on the year of Luke, you're getting a whole lot of sermons about the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and political things, because that's what Luke jumped into. That's, Luke set us up for that kind of preaching. <laughs> it's his fault, not mine. <laughs> this Luke and emphasis expands the definition of who is part of the family of God. So, for a Jew, you had to be you had to be a good Jew, you had to follow the food laws, you had to be circumcised, and if you were an adult Gentile, you weren't real fond of getting snipped when you're that old. When you're a baby, it's one thing, when you're 32, it's something else. And that kept a lot of people away from the faith. For Luke, he tried to expand the definition of who the family of God is, and he, would, he wasn't worried about circumcision, which made it a whole lot easier for Gentiles to become part of the faith. He expanded it. And as I said last week, in that time, they believed that if you were poor, if you, were, if you had a physical deformity or something else, they said that God was upset with you, that God did it because you were sinful. Luke was transforming that understanding. No longer just Jews, no longer just the privileged Jews, because God didn't just bless the rich. In Luke, you have the, the parable of the rich young ruler. Not only was he not given special blessing for being rich by God, he had to walk away and Jesus found no room for him in the kingdom of heaven. He to totally turned the world upside down. And Gentiles, but all human beings, were now part of Luke's understanding. It takes Matthew a lot longer to get there because he was trying to proclaim the gospel to, gen to Jews. Now let's look at the analysis of this parable. 
It's a kingdom parable or a salvation parable, and that's, again, literary criticism, because it's talking about who gets to heaven and who doesn't. Luke describes the eschatological salvation. Eschatological, um, eschat is uh, the Greek root for the word end. So you're talking about end times, gnosis, or uh, logical, logic, end times study. So we're looking, when you hear that big word eschatological, all they're talking about is the end times. And if you read somebody like Tim LaHaye or the, uh, the, uh, Hal Lindsey with his uh, stupid stuff that he writes from the 70s about how we're all going to get flushed up to heaven, um, he uses that word eschatological like he knows what he's talking about. Um, all that word means when you see it is end times. The resurrection of the just by the well-known image of the heavenly meal. So again, in the Bible, the New Testament isn't separate from the Old. They continually are going back to the Old Testament to find reason to write the words that they do. So here's Isaiah chapter uh, 25, verses 6 through 9. Listen for the parallels. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all the peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained and clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. So now we're talking about kingdom being uh, where the, we will live forever, and it begins with a meal. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all their faces. That's the same as Revelation 21. And the disgrace of his people will be taken away from all the earth, and the Lord will have spoken. It will be said on that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So they got this parable, Jesus did, from Isaiah 25, 6 to 9. Then he restated it in a way for his time. Salvation is described in terms of a great banquet given by God for all people. Boy, that would be profound and be very upsetting to the Jewish community. And then in Revelation 19.9, And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these, words are, are, these are true words of God. So the Old Testament and the New, even the book of Revelation, is just... Most of the images from the book of Revelation, which sounds so weird, are just taken from the Old Testament. And now we look at the theological insights that come from this. Shall eat is in the future tense, which means it's something that will happen, of course, in the future. And the reference to the kingdom of God indicates that a man is thinking of, his, of the final blessing. Those who do not accept the present invitation which issues from Jesus' message will also fail to participate one day in the banquet of God. So when they're talking about those who are too busy, like in the Gospel of Thomas, who have, got, have just bought a place and they've got to get that taken care of, or they've got to go do this or that, or they have a wedding they have to prepare for, if they put anything ahead of their faith, according to the, uh, Thomas, they will fail to be part of the final blessing. So it isn't who you are or what faith you are, it's whether you listen and respond to God's word. Now there's cultural insight that we look through as we're reading this. Luke's version of the parable seems to presuppose that according to the upper class customs of the time, the invitation was extended and accepted several days before the banquet was scheduled. So as I said, they would go around in advance, either the private or the military or the slave or the servant, days ahead. The guests were reminded at the right time by a servant specially sent for this purpose. So the servant would go out a second time, one time to let them know that this is going to happen, go around a second time after they thought about it, checked their schedules, and gotten back to him about who was coming. None of those who were originally invited had the decency to, de uh, to decline in a timely manner. And that, in a, uh, I heard... Uh, Kenneth Bailey one time say, and he, he, his family came from this church. He's a wonderful professor. I think he died in 1993, but amazing professor. Kenneth Bailey said, 
that that is a shame that that was a shame based culture and so in the Middle East if you were to not call or show up without a really really good excuse not only were you missing the event but you were shaming the person who made the invitation and so what you would do if you really couldn't make it you would send your servant or perhaps you'd go yourself and you would explain you might even get on your knees to to overly emphasize